All right, so now we're going to start the pictures of Isle of Wight. And uh, what's today? Today is the 21st? Yes. So the 21st of August, 1999. Two weeks before Big 90, 98. Birthday. 98th birthday. We're going through the pictures of when I, when I visited uh, the Isle of Wight. Yeah. Well, this looks like it's high street to me. Is this High Street Carrisville? This here's the church. Uh-huh, that's the church. But of course everything's changed so uh -huh. since I was there. Yeah. They've modernized a lot of things. And you lived right about here? On uh, High Street, where's the and here? This is the Hotel. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I think City. it's over here, isn't it? Yeah, on the other yeah. side. And I, I, I think this is maybe where I was here. And there's a tea house there. Right? 2000, the was was soon open a tea house in New York. Southern Pope John Paul Sheets, China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this video call, you see that? Oh, what are you recording it for? I've told them. The one I've told them. Oh, you're just recording? Yeah. Where did you shoot this one from? So there's a church. Uh huh. This is from up near the castle. Oh, I see. That's a village down here. See, it's just in the middle. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a hamlet. We used to call that a little hamlet. And everybody knows everybody, and um, it's just like a family because it's such a small area. And this is the, you know, this is the castle. Right there, the inside. Oh. So, we, you know, Ray took us and oh, he treated us inside. and we took inside, yeah. I was only inside once. Only once? And that was for the King Edward. King George V, I remember, I was 10 years old and he was coronated. And they opened the castle free. And otherwise everybody had to play and all the school kids, everybody had, could go in free. Uh -huh. And that was the only time I was in there. And uh, so this is Ray at the same place that his yeah, grandfather... Yeah, that's where my father, where father used to uh, have his stand for cards. And there's doors here, they, they can close it up. Uh -huh. They've kept it in very good condition. It's beautiful. Huh? And there, I was taking a picture of some people in just the same place that uh, you know, he, he would be, oh, you know, yeah. take pictures too, so Ray took a picture of that. Oh, yes. Never changes. Uh, did you ever wonder who cut the lawn there? No, I never, I, I didn't was, think about maybe it. Maybe yeah, they had grass that didn't grow. It was always kept so beautiful. And you never saw anybody cutting out of it. And those moats, I told you about those moats. That that's when King Charles, was it the first or second, was imprisoned in the castle when he tried to escape. Did you see the window? That was yes, bent? yes, they showed us that, yeah. yeah. And uh, they used to fill those moats with water to prevent oh. them from uh, getting away. When I was there, uh, one of the princesses lived there, and she had a big dog that used to come down to, to the island, to the village. Mm -hmm. And this is by uh, the uh, sand, the sand cliffs. Oh, is this sand down? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's Where they had all the sand, yeah, he took us there. That uh, was one of my favorite resorts. I had a job there one time at Sand Down in their rooming house, only for a couple months for the tourists. Because that's about all you could do there in the summertime, you know. And, sure. and they, this is, you know, pictures of the sand, all the different colors of the sand. Oh, and this is downtown. This is Newport. Right. Now this is the... Um, this is right where, where uh, uh, behind there is the building. Where I worked. Right. Yeah. Bakery. What was the name of it? Some bakery. Well, mm. this is a very interesting place. I don't know if they still do it. It's called, I think it's called, is it the square? But um, every Tuesday or Wednesday, all the farmers bring their livestock down there to sell the sheep and cows. And, and they'd come uh, through the street, through the village where we lived. We had to close the door so one of them wouldn't go <laughs> in there. And the cows would come and everything. They'd take them down there and they uh, have auction on their stock and sell them. Marketplace. That's the marketplace. Still there, huh? I don't know if they still do that. They probably have a different method now. This is a good picture, right? Yeah. Now where is this? This is right by the sand cliffs, at the bottom of the sand cliffs. Oh. 
was this Tottenham Bay where they have all the covered sand? Yes. Yeah, there used to be an old man, I had said that in the other record that, uh, that your mom made, that he used to um, collect that sand and then make bottles, souvenir. They, they still bottle. do that now. Do they? Yeah. i got a bottle that your grandfather brought me. It's not a bottle like uh, Daddy Neat, we used to call him Daddy Neat. And this is right in front of your house. This one here? That one there, isn't that your house? Well, you see, they changed it because my father was a professional photographer and it had a big window here. And we had a little shop there. And they must have taken out the big window. And this, uh, the landlady lived here. And my father, there's my father's uh, uh, developing room. room. That's what it was. He had a red skylight in there. So it went room to film? A dark room. And he developed all his films there, his postcards. Then he sold them. You know. That's the same place where they came for the animals. That's just the tower. Oh, this is Newport? Yes. How did they like your friend? Oh, they liked her a lot. Yeah. Did she nice. enjoy it? Yeah, you saw it was beautiful. And oh, uh, so this is right by the lake across from your house. This is Eight Bells. They had the, uh, still have the ducks and things there. Over <laughs> feed them. And my father used to bowl there. They had a bowling green. Every Saturday night, Dad went over there to, uh, every Saturday went over there to bowl. And then they had a pup there. And they had all these little um, ho uh, veranda houses outside where they would uh, sit and have their air. That was a wonderful hotel that he found. I think Ray said that uh, he took uh, his uh, family there for dinner. Did you, what did you do when you were there? Um, we, we had a... Uh, we, didn't, we didn't stay overnight. Oh. Um, we just... I don't think we ate at all when we were there. Oh, you didn't? There's a lot of tea houses. I bet you got a cup of tea. I think we had a sandwich somewhere, but then we went home for for. Uh, is this Ray's house? Yes. Oh, he's got a lovely house. Beautiful house. Oh, isn't that nice? And he has a beautiful car, a uh, Jaguar. Oh. And that's Jenny. Yeah, Jenny looks good there. Mm -hmm. They were happy to have you visit them, huh? Is this their home here? Mm -hmm. You know, he has a large collection of birds. Oh. He has many, many birds. Oh. And uh, he, he just loves them like they were Apiary, his children. Is that what they call them? Apiary? Uh, Apiary. Apiary. Apiary? Apiary. Well, that's a lot. It takes a lot of caring. And I think they could survive through the winter outside because they don't have that severe winter unless it's changed. Yeah. But he has so many beautiful, beautiful birds. Oh, rare, yeah. expensive, That's and beautiful birds. Oh, how nice. This is the castle. Uh, that's the church. Oh, the church, I mean, yes, the church. Did you go inside of the church or didn't you? Yeah, we did. Oh, did you? Yeah. I got some other things for you. Oh, good. Because if you went to the vicar, did you see the vicarage? If you went to the vicar, he would let you in. And, uh, so how I, old is that church? I'll show you. I got some. I got some things for you. Huh? Mind zooming out. I'm not sure see what's still on here. Well, we got a uh, couple of little little presents for you. Oh, you did. Yes. This is a a guide from the castle. Oh. Um, oh that's we lovely. picked up when we were there. It just says oh. the history of it. Oh, thank you. Carisburg Castle, and there it is. Here's your town. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wall all around, and yeah, the moats. Mm -hmm. oh, and just some some reading material from the uh, from the Island of Wight. Just the, oh. the when we took the boat over, they give this for the visitors. Oh, how nice! Just things that are going on. Thought maybe a. 
you pick a ferry or was it? Yeah, we, we, ferry. Just, we took a ferry. Yeah, we had the ones where you could see the Indian chucking, chucking, chucking. I used to go with my grandpa, uh -huh. called Grandpa Mitchell. And we have pictures of him where he sent some. I had all those originals. And uh, take me down and show me their works, you know, how it was working. Uh -huh. They have all the modern stuff now, so. Oh, this is nice. Thank you. We got some more little things. Remember you just asked how old the church was? Yes, how old is it? Well, here's a, uh, a guide. We, we paid for this. Um, we got this at the church. There was, they had these just uh, sitting around. And Did you have to pay for that? Mm -hmm. And it sounds from, I think, about 1200. Oh. Um, but you can read through the history. Oh, and uh, such a beautiful, beautiful church. Isn't it? Yeah, it's odd. They still have all the big beams. And that yeah, the big wooden beams, beams, yeah. And then they have the back. A little fountain there, or the baptized. Yeah, a little, little wooden, wooden, wooden fountain. And the wooden pews. Mm -hmm. And they're all good. Now, there are quite a few Catholics there, too, but I don't think there was a Catholic church other than uh, in the nunneries. You know, they probably had their services there. But there were quite a few Catholics there, too. Oh, this is nice. Thank you. This will keep you busy for a yeah. while. So, uh, this picture. Oh, the needle. Did you picture. see this? Yeah, we saw that. Oh, that's fantastic. It is. This is really. And how it remains that way. Uh huh. No. Very unusual. And where was that? I don't remember. What side of the island? It was where it was. It was it bent there? I don't remember, but, uh,. I thought it was it was the most beautiful thing that I saw when I was in England. This the Isle of Wight and that yeah. That's so beautiful, so you know, natural. Isn't that and, a, a very rare thing. Yeah. They called it the needles, I guess, because they called Yeah. Yeah, that's what they come to the Isle of Wight for, you see. Yeah. Beauty. It really is. And uh, I just brought back everything that we, we picked up. So it's just, uh, right. yeah. just a little little guide to Isle of Wight. Osborne House, that's the Navy Academy. That was old Princess Victoria's residence years ago. They made a museum out of it. Now she used to spend her summers on the Isle of Wight. Yes, I know she, she liked that. She her arrives and did their cows. This is cows. They have a lot of uh, regattas there, and then the Prince of Wales comes down and everything. Mm -hmm. I think they still do that. Cow's regatta was a very... A lot of visitors came from that. Now, did you get to see um, my brother's estate? He had a very large farm there. Um, yeah. And it, it was sold, I think. Uh huh. And it said it was beautiful. They had a lot of cats. It takes too much time. Mm -hmm. It's a sensor. He lived to be about 85, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's a little early birthday present for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sick of everything. This is that lovely. Some stationery oh, so you can writing. write me some letters if yeah. when I'm at, I'm at uh, college next year. Oh, how nice. All the rest of everything. Yeah. Well, isn't that it's really fantastic. Nice. Just something so small. So does it have the picture on it to, on every page or is it? Um, I don't know. Good. I didn't open it up. It's a cat. Yeah, I don't think it's on every page, but... I don't write as many letters as I used to, you know. I know. I'm that one. I think that's all, and I have some, I have copies of most of the photos for you. Oh, that's nice. Uh-huh. Very nice. Well, 
I'm so glad that Ray took you there. I'm so glad he did, nice. and, he, and he gave us such a good tour. It was such a beautiful island. You wouldn't have uh, done so well without No, no, not at all. You needed a guide. I so you had a private guide. Yeah. How long did you spend there? Um, a full day. We got oh, there early in the morning, or early in, the early in the afternoon. How was the weather? The beautiful day. Was it? We got lucky. It was good. That, I remember you wanted us to go. We were going to go in March, and you said I should wait till, till later on yeah. in, in uh, May. Because if you uh, get that rainy season, it's miserable. No. Chilly and cold. And we had a nice, nice day. Beautiful blue sky, sunshine. Oh, that was nice. It was nice to get out there. Yeah, when I went to Sunday school, we used to have our Sunday school annual parties. We all went to Sandbell. That was a big deal mm -hmm. for the day. Our teachers, all the teachers' groups would take all the kids from Sunday school there. So I wonder if they still do that. Mm -hmm. That sure was nice. Well, thank you, Hub. <laughs> okay. Nice to see where you're from. Very nice. Mm -hmm. You have anything to say to Ray? Because I'm going to send this to Ray. Oh. <laughs> anything you want to say to Ray? Yeah, Ray, we're thinking of you and wish you were here with us. Uh -huh. And uh, I should really write you a letter, but I'll get around to it one day. <laughs> and my love to your family and Jenny. Oh, thank you, Hilda. Hi, Hilda. <laughs> I know it's very silly, but I just want to have tape for you to show you when you're 130 how amazing you were at 98. How you haven't changed. Hmm? the silly camera and we never ever use it. And so uh you wanna use it now? Wanna use it now. Okay, as I say anything you do is okay with me. Doesn't bother you? Now uh, uh where do we put the <laughs> So tell me some stories, Hilda. Uh, oh, is it a talking to? Yeah. Wow. I can't think of it anymore. I'm uh, dedicating my talk to the sandwich or we're going to burn it again. <laughs> Go up and smoke. Cheese. 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 American cheese. Yellow cheese? The red. So what do you want to do for the big 100th birthday, Hilda? It's coming up. Yeah, pretty close. What are you, are you thinking of anything? Well... Do you want to have all the presidents over? Karen is uh, coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I used to get one from the president. You don't get them anymore? Got it right in. For a one time. Mm -hmm. You have to talk loud enough so it can hear you. Oh. Tell us a story, Hilda. Yeah. Um, in the olden days, they used to only have heating stoves with coal uh -huh. and coke. And 
I met a mother bought me for a wedding present of a beautiful old-fashioned pot belly stove. And it was all, um, we had to polish it, it was all solid brass or something, it always got polished. And it had Eisenhower, your grandmother remembers this, she remembers that story. It had Eisenhower, Eisenglass windows, and I used to say to the kids, don't poke your finger in there, that in the summertime, that stove always stayed. And uh, so you could see the, the coals burning, uh -huh. whatever they call them, those are, when they're hot coals. So it had a, uh, what do you call that, on the top, a filler that you fill it. And every night you had to use the hot, what they called hard coal. They were small, tiny chips, that were, they were expensive. Those were the only ones burned in this pot belly. Um, so, so they had this, uh, what did they call it, it was a filler that you take this shovel that you're taking home and you fill your, your fine coals in there, they're all small so they pass through the hole and go in and every night before you go to bed you fill your um, top that feeds the stove, then that would keep your heat all week, all, all night. Uh -huh. In the morning, you have to do it again. That was for that certain stove. Then we had a good morning stove for cooking. For cooking. Mm -hmm. And that was a great big thing with an oven underneath and about six different uh, plates, and it had a handle to pick it up and uh, put your pot on over the flame, and then you cover it up when you're through. And uh, I used to make my soups and things on that. Now in that one, uh, we could put wood or paper or soft coal. It was hard and soft coal. Hard coal was very expensive, those little shiny ones. So that was what that coal shovel, or a hod, they call it an H-O-D, was used. And, uh... and of course it was painted in black enamel because it would get dirty from I had this painted by one of my tenants because I was going to use it for magazine holder or flowers or plants or something. And I kept it all the years and I would like you to keep this in the family. You have a fireplace so you can put your logs in there. And this your daddy uh, <laughs> says no if he objects to it because I know maybe he wouldn't want it. Otherwise, you can store it, but that's the story of that. Then, for uh, the uh, ashes, we had to take ashes out every day because it was always ashes. And then we had a big sifter on like a um, um, broomstick with a long broom, and you put all the cinders and shake it to shake all the dust out. And then we would burn those cinders, re-burn them in the cooking stove. So you get double use out of your fuel, but it was a big chore. And then you had to chop wood. You had to have enough wood in for the winter. If you didn't have any wood, you couldn't start that. Uh, the, the one with the feeder uh, was always going in the winter, but the other one used to go out at night. We didn't keep that one on. So you had to have enough wood uh, in the house, chop wood, to start that kitchen fire every morning. And that went all day, but at night we would check it as the fire out in the kitchen. The other one was pretty safe with the... So then we would sift the coal to re-burn the cinders to save money. Mm -hmm. And then when you needed the coal to come in, the coal man brought it in with the bags on, on his back. And if you were poor and you couldn't pay for it, they'd dump it in the alley and you had to take a wheelbarrow yourself and bring it all in. You had a coal shed, everybody had a coal shed to keep stuff in. So when it was during the Depression in the uh, uh, late 29s, early 30s, about 29 or so, we couldn't um, afford it and uh, we had it dumped by the building and then your great grandfather would a wheelbarrow and shovel it into the shed. So those were some of the um, hardships that we had. And I can remember, oh, then my washing, uh, we ha I had a great big tub and a stool, stool, uh, a stool to put the tub on. And uh, we had always had a day to wash. There was a day for everything. 
Monday was washing, Tuesday was ironing, Wednesday was uh, shopping, Thursday was uh, something else, Friday was baking, Saturday was shopping. We went to the store always for um, uh, fresh uh, biscuits at a certain time. My mother-in-law would say, go down the bakery, get the biscuits are out now and bring a half a dozen with our coffee. So we went down and got the hot biscuits. So um, we uh, had an oven uh, for baking on that stove and I had a very small gas range, a little two burner, that if we didn't have enough fuel or something, we could just cook on. So then, when Monday came, you were ready to do your laundry and you take all, you get a pail and you uh, heat the water on a pail and you dump it in the big washing machine, not machine, the wash tub, and then you have a, um, a board, a metal board, it's wood, wood size, I wish I'd have kept my, and you wash, get some knuckles, you wash all your clothes by hand, and then you got to rinse them, and then finally I got a ringer, they put it, they, put it on the side of the tub and that was a big deal that I had a ringer. I didn't have to ring by hand. <laughs> and then in those days the men used to wear the long underwear when it was cold. And you had those big men, men's one piece underwear, long suits to wash. And even when it was cold I would hang them on the line and they'd all freeze stiff. Oh boy. It was so cold I was out there hanging up. Then the sun came out and they thawed out. So we used to string a line up in the yard and then is it nice enough to hang out? We'd hang them out. And it smells so nice and fresh when you bring them in. So one day, uh, your great grandpa, pa, uh, when he was at work or something, I used to leave the tub stand and he would empty it when he came home. And you heard the story, I think, about that we had a lot of birds. Did you tell me that story? Well, my father, Grandpa Piper, or Grandpa Piper, for a hobby, raised canaries. Really? And sold them. And uh, I knew exactly what he used to feed them, because I had to chop the eggs, hard-boiled eggs and crackers. And I did a lot of chopping of eggs and mix it up. And he would feed them. And we had a little postcard shop. And uh, he was a photographer for his... Uh, postcards and we had a big uh, supply of those in there and other things, souvenir items that we used to sell. So he put all his birds in the um, store because if a customer wanted a bird, he was selling birds too. So he had them um, all in the, uh, in the store as well. So your great-grandpa Butzman decided that we should raise some birds, because I told him about this. So I said, well, it's a very tricky thing, because I know I help my dad, and I know uh, that they need a lot of uh, special diet, and you've got to know the season, when they, how long, and so forth, the mating. It's, it's quite a thing. And my father had linnets, a linnet bird crossed with a canary, a beautiful singing canary, and they'd come out of different. Then you had the crops. I, I knew the names of all those at one time canary with a crop on. So we went out, we buy these birds. So we weren't getting very far with them. They laid eggs, but they never hatched up and so forth. So hmm. we had, we were living in an old house on the first floor, partition, no, no steps because I had the buggies with the pigs, you know. So we had a little room in the, in the back entrance and the people upstairs used to have to go through there to go out. So every once in a while, we let the birds out in that little room to fly. People upstairs come down and leave the door open and all the birds go out. Oh, boy. Oh. All the canaries gone. How many? And I was alone. How many canaries? Fifty birds. Fifty? Yeah, maybe fifty or so. Yeah, big cages. Oh, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I called old Grandpa Butzman. They lived not too far from us. Pa, come over. The birds all go down. He comes over, he puts the cage cages out. They say if you put a cage, you lost the whole blooming batch. Didn't get wrong, but that was the end of the bird race. <laughs> so that was an experience. Well, the reason I got on that subject was one day he didn't 
empty the um, tub, and we kept one or two pet birds. I had one uh, that I loved very much, he used to talk to me and sing, and he lived a long time, but I used to let them out in my kitchen, and my kitchen had plate racks all around, and I had all my beautiful plates up on these racks, and they'd go behind there and, uh, and hide. So I left the tub, I think it was overnight, and uh, the bird, I had let the bird out and here he fell in the top of the ground. So I lost my little linnet, so it's a linnet. So then I had one canary, very, very nice one. We kept him for many, many, many years, used to say. They used to have one here um, on the floor. Uh, Irv had one, and I'd go down there, walk down there to hear the uh, canary sing. It reminded me so much of uh, the birds that we had. You know. So that's the end of the bird story. That finished that one. So then uh, I finally got a ringer and uh, I had, oh, then we had the old ice boxes. And the man would come around, you, you had a card and it said 100 pounds, 50, 25 or whatever you wanted. You put the card in the show, whatever amount you wanted. And he came around, with, he had a leather thing over his shoulder, like a vest, and he'd come with this big hunk of ice with the tongs put it in your box. Uh -huh. And then you had to have a drip pan underneath and you last thing you said did you empty the ice water because if not you're to club in the morning all over the kitchen floor. Yeah. So we didn't have a refrigerator either. So I remember when I got my first refrigerator and it was second hand and that was when we moved in another building. And boy, I thought I had the world I had What year was that? Yeah. What was the year? So we had the old wooden ice boxes. Until when? Yeah. Gosh, it was uh, let's see, 19, uh, 20, uh, in the 20s, late 20s. Uh, the women had a very a hard job to do housekeeping and everything. We didn't have any of the, uh, we didn't have a vacuum cleaner, we just had a um, carpet sweeper. But my house was always immaculate. I, I am a night person. I get more pet at night. Some people are early risers, but I like to sleep in the morning. And I would put the kids to bed, and then uh, I'd scrub my kitchen up and clean up. And when I got in the morning, it's all done, nice and spotless. So uh, then they had that awful depression. Of course, that was a terrible thing. I changed through that. Tell me some uh, World War I stories. Some what? World War I stories. Well, that was later and there wasn't too much of that, just that the whole island was only full of soldiers. That's all, there's all troops everywhere. And the Isle of Wight? Yeah. It was all soldiers? The eight bells had, they called it billeting, you had to billet a soldier. We didn't take any because we didn't have any spare room, but all the hotels were taken over. Everything, wherever there was space, they put the troops in. And they went out to train up on the downs. We call it the downs. It's like a big, that's where my father had his, I tell you about the vegetable plot my dad had. And he had his vegetable plot up there. And he used to take us hiking, hiking over the downs. We call it the downs. And it was a big, long, long piece of the car, but we wanted to go with him. He carried his walking stick, you know. <laughs> Take a couple of us walking like that. And um, they used that for their training. Call it bivouac something, and they trained and shot off the guns and everything up on the downs. Uh, and they were only there a short time. Then they moved up and they were trained. And then another match came in, and they took over the whole island. And they took over that Osborne house. They were built it there and everything. Quite a long time. I think that would have been uh, 1914. Uh, a long time ago. Yeah. But then you went to Paris. Mm -hmm. Then you went to Paris? Yeah. Why but Paris? I think, uh, I think that uh, uh, those days were, it upset the island a, a, a lot because uh, they uh, restricted so many things. And even my father had to go and work in a factory. He was a polished gent who never did any uh, But they trained him. They had to go and do what they could do. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, 
George was telling me that when they built the new house, I was on my own before they when they built that house. But George said that um, he had my dad had saved enough money from the penny post cards, and I didn't know it, but I always suspected it. It got a big settlement from the government because my oldest brother was drowned, uh, blown up, Tom. Yeah. And I often wondered if they, they must have gotten the settlement. And then George told me when he was here that Dad got the army, uh, government settlement, and he built that house. Did you see that house on yeah. Crown Road? He built that. So he didn't have quite enough money for a set a fence at that time, and he saved some money, and he wanted a beautiful wrought iron, beautiful fence up or something. I've never seen that built because I was on my own then. So got up one morning and the fence was gone. Yeah, that's okay. The government had ordered them to get all the scrap metal and they just came along and took your fence and you didn't have one thing to say about it. The women had to turn in all their jewelry or stuff that they could use. Every wow. piece of scrap metal was. Wow. So he didn't put up another fence. Was there a fence on you saw? I don't think so. I never saw that. So. so why did you go to Paris? Well, to uh, do some uh, why war, Paris? war work. Uh, war work. I worked for the uh, uh, judge advocate and I was writing up um, uh, the claims for the uh, soldiers, AWOLs and stuff like that. And they didn't have all the equipment that you have now. I had to run a mimeograph. It was all uh, dirty, you know, type them and make the, um, say, 100 copies on them and stuff like that. Right. So, but Lel was the one that got into nursing. She really served her country. My sister, she was a nurse and uh, she had far more experience with uh, nursing. And uh, I don't know when she died or how old she was. I don't think she, I think she was only in the 60s when she died. So that's the way the story goes. Oh, I'm getting sleepy. I usually take a nap. <laughs> so you want to take a nap now? Day, you know. That was nice. Yes, thank you. Hilda, we, uh, we were talking, Eric asked yesterday how you, got to, how you lived so, so long, so well. And we want the secret. We want the secret on tape. Well, I don't know if there is any secret. You can do it if you want to. And, uh, how did you do it? Well, I really back myself on my family genes. The British have very good genes, and I was uh, brought up near the ocean, had the cleanest air to breathe and everything. And I attribute that. If you have bad genes, then something's going to go haywire. So there is no promise that you, that you, uh, you have a secret and someone can do the same thing. But the Lord can give you these good genes, and they're precious if you get good ones. But how many are born with bad genes? Then they don't have a chance. And, but if you're given the good genes and you live a healthy lifestyle, don't abuse your genes. And one is the drinking, that's a detriment to your health, and of course the, uh, the dope. And uh, smoking is more detrimental than most people realize. And you get enough rest and you get exercise. Then comes the diet. And I think you're all on a good diet because you look pretty well proportioned. You don't have any fatties here. But some people are obese because they have a uh, disease. Fatness is not a disease. But when it comes to obesity, that's a disease. Then you've got a real problem to take 100, uh, over 100 pounds, and no matter how much you diet, you're hungry all the time. They're now doing all kinds of um, surgery, making the stomach smaller so you don't eat so much. And it's really all up here in what I call the upper story. If you work up here and get your mind right, and you're determined that you have a standard, a health standard is very important. And I taught you that from when you were small. Don't do anything that's going to jeopardize your health. That's your pearl of great price, your precious gift. When you lose that, you can't enjoy life, so you must protect that. So, have a healthy diet. 
and you're doing that. I don't say you have to go on a rigid diet, but uh, be normal and you eat, eat regularly and uh, good food. I eat frozen dinners because they're supposed to be uh, okay now and they're very convenient for me and I don't cook. And then get a, uh, lots of rest. I'm a very good sleeper. You cannot burn the candle at both ends, as we used to say. So always get your rest. Then the biggest one is this upper story, or don't blow your top. Because if you get nervous and you have a bad disposition, you're always aggravated, you're going to be sick. Because that affects your entire organism, you know. And so you'll get a nervous disease or a nervous breakdown if you're hot tempered and uh, have a, a problem with that. I happen to be a very um, easygoing, relaxed person, and I think that has a tribute to, to my uh, long life. Another thing that I know you're both going to do this, you prepare for your old age and get yourself pensioned or get it to where you or save and see that you are have no financial worries. Now, I don't say I'm wealthy, but I can live at a nice standard because I save my money and I did it on a regular basis. I used to put ten dollars um, a month away. That's what I bought my condo on. Ten years, I had enough for a down payment, and I never touched that money. I don't have any money that was in the bank. I never drew on those accounts. So if you can retire with dignity and with comfort, that will give you the added years too, because you don't have to worry of uh, finances. So that's very important. You know, our young people today are spending way too much money. And they they want every gadget, everything that comes along, and they they really are very big spenders, according to what I hear on the TV. I don't go out with young people, I don't know, <laughs> but I get it all on my TV. And uh, watch your credit cards. I hope you're not on the credit card binge, because if you do that, you'd be in debt for all your life. So try to stay out of debt, pay your bills. I don't owe one penny. When my husband died, didn't know any owe any money. I had friends that were widowed and they had to pay off big debts from their husbands. So in case you do uh, marry, don't do that to your wife. So, and it's your, mainly your, uh, your mind, uh, how you think, and if you can live at a, a nice peaceful uh, uh, pace, and also to be kind to people. I have a philosophy that if I can help somebody, if it's within my power, to try to do good to someone, do my good deed every day, and uh, don't argue with people, don't get into fights. Just, I used to say to you, run away, I, Kirk was the one I used to say, don't get messed up in any uh, quarrels or anything, run away from error or evil, run as fast as you can, and run toward good. And Kurt had a funny experience, you know, he went to a dance or something, did they ever tell you about this? And he went there, and he was coming out of the car or something, and he, uh, I think it was, I don't know if it was a masquerade party or what, but he had on a, um, what do you call the Spanish hats that the men wear? Sombrero? He had that on. And some uh, three or four kids were going to beat him up just because, just because he had that hat on. Grandma could tell you the story. I was down there at the time. And he ran for his life. It's a kind of a party thing. And uh, stay away from alcohol. That's one of the main things, because you can get um, hooked on that, addicted to that, just the same as you can dope or smoking. It's an addiction. And then say coffee now is the same thing. I had a friend who drunk 16 cups of coffee a day. Pop <laughs> was on all day long. I said, Selma, where are you put it? What are you doing all that? She was actually so addicted to it, she got a headache so she didn't have it. Wow. So those are all, stay away from bad habits. Uh -huh. And uh, that should do it. Of course, I can't say you're gonna, how long you're going to live. Nobody knows. And then uh, I am uh, very religious. I pray a lot. And I've taught uh, all of my grandchildren to rely on that. There's never a night that I go to bed that I don't thank my father for my long life he's given me, for keeping me in good health protecting me, guiding me, sustaining me, 
for bringing me through many difficulties and trials, and I ask forgiveness for any sins that I may have committed, and uh, then I fall asleep, and I never go to sleep without doing that. So I hope you learn how to pray or that you do a little bit of that. I'm not going to ask what your religions are, because they're all the same. There's only one God, and does it make what matter? Some call him Allah, and some call him Jesus, and it doesn't make any difference. And that has helped me a great deal. And I think that um, you're really a poor lost soul if you don't have something beside human help to rely upon. So I hope that um, you agree with me on that, that a lot of people don't. And the Jewish people are, are very, very religious, and theirs is what well, Yahweh, I think, isn't there God? One of you Jewish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm Jewish. Yahweh? Yeah, that's the yeah, Yahweh. Yeah. It's a Jewish one. And uh, the, uh, they're all the same, but they're using a different name. So I don't say you have to go to church or anything like that because the Lord doesn't know if you go or not. <laughs> he doesn't keep a register or a book. <laughs> but it's for your own good that you do need some religious protection. It doesn't make any difference what it is. At least that's my opinion. Now you ask me how I lived and what I did. And this has been all my life since childhood. So. It worked for you. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important. I don't go to church anymore. I have my church right at home. But I'm not a religious fanatic. I don't, everybody, I have one friend in here. She was a very ardent Catholic, a very lovely person. I used to go down to her house and you know, I never left her apartment without she gave me something to bring out. Even if it was only a cookie, a piece of cake or a cookie. I had to take something from, from her. But she was a very uh, fanatic religionist. And every time I'd come down there, she'd say, now sit down, now we're going to do this for it. I wasn't Catholic, you know, but I didn't mind. And she says, um, I'm going to put on uh, Father so-and-so or so-and-so. And I said, well, really, I want to go, I have something to do. But she was very overpowering with it. And uh, there are people like that. So you can go, you can have too much of anything, in my opinion. I always say, get in the middle of the street, stay there. Don't go over to the side. It's got a nice, the straight and narrow road is difficult to travel. But the broad one in the Bible, it says, is the one that leads to destruction. And you can go. So you just stay in the middle of the road of have, have a, um, a, a, what could I say, a pattern. Because I did it when I was young. I had a pattern. I knew what I was going to do with my life, you know. If you have a pattern and you follow that and you protect yourself from um, false influences, because so many get in trouble because somebody talks them into something. You don't really want to do it, but you do it. Do your own thinking. And, uh, my upper story is pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I do forget and I get names mixed up I, and things like that, but that's normal for my age. Yeah. And don't be afraid to get old when you're there. Think of me, that you knew somebody that told you it's not a bad thing. I don't know why so many people dread it. There are people that, that have told me, I have heard one time, he said, well, I don't want to get that old. So I said, well, um, about living to be 80 or 75. I wouldn't want to live that far. Now, why? Do you know why? They don't like old people and they're afraid of being an old, old person. That's foolish. Everything age is a plant, an animal, everything. And age brings wisdom. You learn. That's why they always took the older people in the early churches. They used to go to the heads, and they were lawyers. They were regular lawyers. They served as lawyers. They'd come there with all their uh, legal problems and, uh, and solve them that way. So there's always somebody to go to for help if you can't do it yourself. A lot of people have to go to uh, psychiatry, psychiatrists and stuff like that, but then they've got a mental illness with that. So that's about it, and I don't know of any real bad 
ailments, uh, illnesses even way back in my family. I remember my grandpa, I loved him very dearly, and he was an old seaman. Uh, he was always away at sea and he came home, uh, he was a merchant marine, very quiet man, about the tallest, the tallest one he was ever tall. And he lived to be, in that, those days he lived to be 86 or 88, and that was an extremely long life. In the, in the early 90s, they were all, they considered long life there 65 or 70. Yeah. And there are more people now living to be 100, they say, than ever before. So it's possible to, somebody just said to me, you know, uh, your, your life is going to be short compared to ours because they're saying that we're going to live to be 150. <laughs> I don't know. I said, well, not from what I understand because there's too much stuff for this, uh, unhealthy and bad. I don't know how they're going to do it. Oh, the, the um, implants and the transplants. I said, okay, so you get an implant for this and that bus, and then you get one for that, but there'll be a, a, a time when you can't get one, you know, because one organ can go and another organ can go. But I think it's wonderful that they can do that. We're living in a wonderful age. See, my husband died of coronary occlusion. There was no help at all then. I remember at that time that um, uh, when my father-in-law passed on with the gallbladder operation, he survived the surgery, but he didn't take care of it afterwards. He went home without any care, and that was when we had that kind of a thing there that you put your ashes in, the, and he started uh, emptying the ashes and things, and he must have gotten an infection, and he died. And that was when penicillin came in. And I remember my sister-in-law saying, too bad, they've got a wonder drug. I wonder how we could get that wonder drug. It just came in then. I would say that was in 1937, 35 or something. And you have all that now. But now I heard on the news yesterday that there's a new bug out, a new terrible bacteria that they can't control because too many people are full of antibiotics and it is destroying their normal and natural immune system. And I always knew that you should not take too much uh, of uh, medication for that because your natural system can't work then. It's got to rely on that drug. So there's a new, the, yesterday I heard this, that there's a new terrible uh, bacteria that they've got to now get a new uh, antibiotic for, and they're working on that, and they'll come up with it. Same with cancer, they're coming up with a lot of things for that. So you're living in a wonderful age, it's true, but I can't quite see anybody living to be 150. Now, I'm going to be jealous if they do. <laughs> when I'm up there, I'm going to say, hey, what's going on down there? <laughs> they're living a long life down there now. Mine was a short one. <laughs> oh, I'm only kidding. So is that what you wanted yes, to Yes, thank you very much, Elda. Oh, okay. Very nice. And I wanted to find out from you a little about what's going on. Okay.